Okay, good morning. Uh, the title of the message this morning is, What Decision Do I Make? What Decision Do I Make? And we are in Acts chapter 1, verse 15 to 26. Acts chapter 1, verse 15 to 26. What decision do I make? So, we're continuing our study through the book of Acts. And last week we looked at our need for prayer. Uh, we saw the importance of praying together, of praying about our circum, uh, excuse me, about our present circumstances, and praying about the future. This week we're going to talk about decision making. Uh, one of the struggles that I've always had is with making a decision when I'm given more than one option. For example, when I joined the army, there were a couple decisions I had to make. First. I had to decide whether I wanted to join active duty or the National Guard. Now, active duty meant that I would be leaving Maine and going wherever the Army wanted me to go. Yeah, I'd get to see a lot of different parts of the country, possibly the world. But on the other hand, with the uh, National Guard, that meant I would be serving part-time and I would be meeting the needs of the state. At the same time, the needs of the country, but mainly the needs of the state. Uh, I'd only have to go to drill one uh, weekend a month and two weeks during the summer. But if the active duty had a mission that they couldn't fill with one of their units, then they could activate a National Guard unit and then I would be serving on active duty. So there was always that uh, chance that I might have to serve active if I was in the Guard. Uh, Sergeant Cummings, he was the National Guard recruiter at the time, and he really wanted me to join the Guard. He let me come to some of their drills so I could see what it was like. Uh, he answered any questions I had. He encouraged me along the way. And uh, I remember that he gave me a bunch of stickers and National Guard memorabilia. So I had National Guard stickers all over the back of my car. Uh, I had all sorts of shirts and hats and, you know, I just went all out with it. Uh, so I had my decision made to join the Guard, but I wasn't 17 yet, so I couldn't take that final step and enlist. Then I met Sergeant Brown, who was the active duty recruiter. And uh, one of my favorite movies at the time was Black Hawk Down. It was a movie that told the true story about the Army Rangers in Mogadishu, Somalia, uh, who were attacked by thousands of militiamen. Well, Sergeant Brown had been there because he was serving with the 10th Mountain Division. So he got to tell me some stories firsthand about what happened over there. And then he took me on a ride in the Army Humvee that he drove around, and he gave me a bunch of stickers and shirts, uh, just like uh, Sergeant Cummings had, but these were all active duty Army ones, and he gave me other cool stuff. He told me all about what it was like to travel, and about the pay, and the benefits, and all that good stuff. Now, before I knew it, Sergeant Brown had me just as convinced to join active duty as Sergeant Cummings had me to join the National Guard. So... I had a decision to make, and it was a difficult one, but ultimately I chose active duty, and that was God's will for me because he had a plan for my life. Now, I'm sure most of you have had to make difficult decisions in your life as well, and that's what we see here with the disciples. They've got a difficult decision to make about who will replace Judas Iscariot as the 12th disciple. So let's look at some of the ways that they make these decisions um, and how, how people make their decisions. How the disciples made their final decision and how people today uh, make decisions. How we as Christians should be making our decisions. So first of all, we see that some people give up. Some people give up. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. We'll read down to verse 20. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled with the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with, with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem. So that field is called in their own language, Ekeldama, the, uh, that is, the field of blood. 
What is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. Well, when I was a kid, I was pretty emotional. On top of that, I was a shy kid, and that combination made for some pretty embarrassing moments. One of those moments happened when I was in the sixth grade. Our class was playing Duck, Duck, Goose, and there was a girl there that I had a crush on, and I remember being nervous because I didn't want to be picked. Anyways, at one point, the person who was it tagged her as the goose, so she ran around trying to make it back to her spot, and she didn't get there on time, so now she was it. Uh, while my heart was beating because I was nervous, I was hoping that she wouldn't pick me, and so she went around once, you know, duck, 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 and I had a breath of relief when she went by me, but then she went around the circle again, and she came back to me, and she shouted, touched me on the head, and she shouted, goose. <laughs> so then, of course, she started to run, like you do when, when you tag a person, but what did I do? Well, I froze. You know, I wanted to get up and run after her because that was part of the game, but I froze because I was nervous. Well, at that point, other kids started saying, Bobby, get up, run, you're the goose, so come on, hurry up. But I stayed seated and I started to get red, and she stopped and she looked at me, and I was even more embarrassed. <laughs> and then the other kids, they got annoyed and they started to yell at me and and then, instead of playing, I said, I give up. I'm done. And I got up, and I walked over to the other side of the room. I was embarrassed. I was sad. I was angry. Well, I tell that story because I, obviously, I shouldn't have given up. And I should have made the decision to get up and become the next person to be it. But at that moment, I wasn't thinking clearly. And that's one of the things that we see here with the 12th disciple, Judas Iscariot. Uh, he made the decision to give up at a time when I don't think that he was thinking clearly. Uh, in verse 15, Peter stands up and he addresses his brothers and sisters in Christ. And the topic at hand is Judas Iscariot. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that some people view Peter at this point as just a fisherman. You know, very little knowledge of the scriptures, just a fisherman. But notice here, before he has received the Holy Spirit, he points back to the book of Psalms and, you know, explaining that scripture prophesied Judas would betray Jesus. He says, the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. One of those scriptures is found in Psalm chapter 109, verse 8 which says, let his days be few, and let another take his office. And the other is found, uh, found in Psalm 69, verse 25, which says, let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in his tent. Now, Jesus knew all along that Judas was going to betray him. The disciples, they didn't know until it happened. But now that it's all happened, it all makes sense to them. So, Peter here, he's filling in the blanks for, for us, uh, filling in the blanks of the final hours of Judas's life because Judas needed to be replaced. Well, why did Judas need to be replaced? Wouldn't the 11 good disciples have been enough to carry on the work of Jesus and spread the gospel? Well, part of that answer is found in verse 17, it, where it says that he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Well, remember, Jesus chose 12 disciples, and Judas was one of those who was chosen. After he betrayed Jesus, he had a choice to make. You know, Judas, he could repent and be restored, just like Peter repented of his denial of Jesus, and, and then Jesus restored him. That option was there for Jesus, um, excuse me, for Judas. The other option was not to repent, and unfortunately, that's the choice that Judas made. Uh, he decided that his sin was too big for Jesus to forgive. Well, turn with me to Matthew chapter 27, if you will. Matthew chapter 27. I'd like to look at verse 3 to 10. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 to 10. That's where we get some more details uh, about Judas 
after he betrayed Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 to 10. Matthew 27, verse 3 says, Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful. And he brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? You see to it. And he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, and departed, and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests took the silver pieces and said, It's not lawful to put them into the treasury, because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together, and bought with them the potter's field, to bury strangers in. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day, and then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Okay, so, as you can see, Judas... He was remorseful, so he realized that what he had done was wrong, and he even named his sin. He said, I betrayed innocent blood. But instead of repenting and receiving the mercy and forgiveness of Jesus, he chose to take his own life by hanging himself. And the description that we're given in verse 18 and 19 is quite gruesome and gross. Uh, his entrails gushed out, which means that uh, he burst open and his intestines and his guts came pouring out. So, so Judas, he gave up. And I believe that that was the wrong decision on his part, but it was a fulfillment of prophecy. That's exactly what the Bible said would happen. That's exactly what Jesus knew would happen. And that's how it happened. Um, that brings us to the other part of the reason why Judas had to be replaced. Uh, in verse 20, Peter quotes from Psalm 109, verse 8, which says, Let another take his office. So, Peter and the disciples weren't going to replace Judas on a whim. Uh, no, they were going to be obedient to God by being obedient to Scripture. Well, what about us today? Are there times when... We're walking with God, and we're serving Him, and then we make the wrong decision, and we give up. Uh, the answer is yes. For example, we'll be doing great. We'll be going to church regularly, reading our Bible, praying, fellowshipping with believers, and feeling really close to the Lord. But then something happens, uh, and we get discouraged, and we get tired, and we give up. Maybe we just stop going to church or we stop communicating with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we stop reading our Bible, being connected to the Lord, and we start to get distant from Him and we become overwhelmed by burdens and trials. Maybe we give in to a sin once and then we give in to it again and again and before we know it, it becomes easier to commit that sin. Um, lying, gossip, lust, envy, pride. The list goes on and on of any number of sins that, as Scripture says, so easily entangle us. Maybe some of us are there right now since we can't be meeting in person for worship. Maybe some of us have been there for a while and we're down. We can't get back up. I encourage you not to give up. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 tells us to not grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 tells us to not lose heart, not to give up, because we're being renewed day by day. So, brothers and sisters, fix your eyes on Christ. Don't give up. God will bring you through whatever it is that you're going through. Don't give up. Keep your eyes on Christ. Second, we see that some people 
talk about it. When making a decision, some people talk about it. Verse 21 to 23, Acts chapter 1, verse 21 to 23, it says, Therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. We'll stop there for now. Well, earlier I mentioned that I had a decision to make whether to join active duty or the National Guard. Well, then after I made my decision to join active duty, I had to make a decision about what job I wanted to have. Well, at first I thought that I wanted to be a police officer when I left the Army, so I thought that I'd join as an MP, which is a military police officer. Sergeant Brown told me all about what the job entailed, he showed me videos of MPs in action, and he told me that it was a great job to have. So I was very interested. I was very close to signing up to be an MP. And that's what I was planning to pursue. But then I started to think about my desire to be a pastor someday. And maybe that might be as a chaplain in the military. So Sergeant Brown told me the best job to have if I was going to do that someday was to be a chaplain assistant. You know, chaplains, they don't carry weapons, so uh, me as the chaplain assistant, I would be a bodyguard to the chaplain um, because I could carry a weapon. And then I'd also help the chaplain with uh, administration work and scheduling counseling sessions and referring soldiers to speak to the chaplain, setting up church services, all sorts of different tasks to help the chaplain succeed, um, as basically as the, they're the pastor of the unit, so... I'm there to help them succeed. So I talked with Sergeant Brown and my parents about both options, and I talked with some people who either had served or were currently serving as chaplain assistants, and I finally decided that I wanted to join as a chaplain assistant. Uh, I share that story because talking about both jobs with other people helped me to make my final decision. And that's what we find here with the disciples. Before they take that final step, and make their decision, they talk about it with each other. Um, you know, they go over their options, they narrow down their choices. First, the replacement for Judas had to be someone who had been with the disciples and Jesus since the beginning of his ministry when he, had, uh, bapt when he was baptized by John the Baptist. Uh, now, even though Jesus at that time had chosen 12 disciples as his closest followers, uh, to, to be his closest followers for the three years of his ministry. There were still many men and women who followed him during his ministry, and we find a group of 120 of them here with Peter and the other disciples. Um, so there were several options for who the 12th disciple could be. But second, the replacement for Judas had to be someone who had seen the resurrected Jesus. That's because the disciples were going to be spreading the gospel throughout the world. And since the church was new, since it was just forming, they needed to have first-hand accounts to verify the, authent uh, excuse me, the authenticity of the truth and the good news that they were preaching. So that included his teachings and his miracles and his resurrection. So as the disciples talked about it, they were able to narrow it down to two men, uh, Barsabas and Matthias. Notice that they proposed these two men. So it wasn't a competition. It wasn't someone choosing their favorite friend or anything like that. They found two who fit the qualifications the best, and they proposed them as the candidates. So there was no arguing. There was no fighting. I believe that shows the disciples and these two men, uh, they were humble, and their heart's desire was for the glory of God, not their own glory. So what about us today as Christians? There are many times when we'll have to make decisions, and we'll need to talk about it before we make a final decision. For example, I was hesitant to close the doors of the church when we first did, because I knew it was going to be difficult on all of us. I remember standing in the sanctuary 
uh, talking with Wayne a couple of weeks before we closed the doors. And he said, you know, Bobby, this virus is bigger than people think. And we're going to have to start thinking about what we're going to do as a church because uh, there's going to be a lot of changes happening uh, in the in the community, in our state. Um, there's a lot going to be going on, and so we really got to be thinking about this. Are, are we going to have to close the doors to protect the people? Well, at the time, I didn't think the virus was going to be as big of a problem as it is, so I thought maybe perhaps Wayne was overreacting. And I figured the, the brightest minds were working on a vaccine to cure um, people from all over the world, so I figured, you know, they'll find something quickly and it'll all be over with. Uh, but Wayne was right. Within two weeks, we made the decision to close the doors temporarily. And then within a week, it was mandated by the governor. So we would have had to do it anyways. And Wayne, Wayne and I, we talked a lot about the virus before we came to that decision. But we did so respectfully, without arguing, without criticizing one another. Um, and then... I started with audio sermons, and someone suggested I try to do a video sermon. Well, I was hesitant. As I've told you before, I don't like being on camera. Um, I'm not comfortable with it. So I was hesitant, but after I talked, to, talked about it with a few people, I decided to go ahead and try it, and I believe that switching over to video was the right thing to do. And God has blessed that decision. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14 says, Where there is no guidance... A people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22 says, Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, we read, Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Well, Obviously, we won't always agree on everything, but that shouldn't stop us from talking with each other when there's decisions to be made. You know, uh, should I be doing this or should I do that? What do you think? But it's important for us to be loving and kind and courteous when we're talking about the decisions we have to make. You know, we all have big decisions in our lives we have to make. And, uh, you know, when we're, when we're, talking about those decisions with each other. We might be doing it by phone, you know, right now, by phone, by email, or from six feet away when you're at the grocery store and you see each other. Um, it might be something small, a small decision that needs to be made, or a big decision that needs to be made. But don't be afraid to bring it up and talk about it with someone. You know, as the family of God, that's that's what we're, we're here for each other. We're family. So brothers and sisters, let's stay connected and talk about different decisions we might have to make in our lives uh, instead of going it alone, you know. Uh, remember, we're in this together. My cousin Matt loves to say that. We're in this together, and that couldn't be more true than right now. We are in this together. Lastly, we see that some people pray about it. When there's a decision to be made, some people pray about it. Verse 24, Acts chapter 1, verse 24, and we'll read down to verse 26. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. When I was a kid, one of the jobs I thought I might, excuse me, that I thought I might like to have one day was a police officer. So I went on several ride-alongs with local law enforcement officers. Uh, back when uh, um, Donnie Smith was a, a sheriff's deputy before he became sheriff, I went on ride-along with him, and then with a couple state troopers. Um, this was all when I was in high school, and my favorite TV show was Cops. I watched it with my dad all the time. Uh, I really thought that one day I wanted to be a cop. So when I got out of the Army, one of the jobs that caught my attention was in law enforcement. Well, for one reason or another, I didn't pursue it before Sherry and I got married. But after we were married, I started to think about it again. Well, one day Sherry got an email on Facebook from the Baileyville Chief of Police, uh, 
uh, at the time, Sean Donahue. And it said, I know your husband is an Army veteran, and I'd like to speak with him about joining our de department as an officer full time. Uh, well, when Sherry read that email to me, I was really excited. I thought, man, you know, I didn't even tell him, hey, I might be interested in being a police officer. So this, this must be an open door from God. This must be something that he wants me to do. But before I made the final decision, Sherry reminded me, Bobby, we need to pray about this. And so we did. And even though I was really excited about it, I didn't have a piece about it and neither did Sherry. So finally I told Sherry, okay, I will go meet with the chief and we'll just see how it goes. So that gave me an opportunity to ask him some questions, but I left that meeting knowing it was not what God wanted me to do. So I told Sherry and she agreed, so I did not pursue it. Well, shortly after that, I started training in the ministry under Pastor Trot because that was the true calling in my life. And eventually God called me here to uh, the Baron Church. So I share that story because it reminds me of the importance of praying before making big life-changing decisions. And that's what we find with the disciples here. Before they make a final decision about who will be the twelfth disciple, they take time to pray about it. Now it's interesting because before Jesus t chose the twelve disciples, um, he also took time to pray. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 13, we read, It came to pass in those days that Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Okay, so the disciples, they remembered that, that Jesus had prayed before he chose them. So they were following the example of Jesus by doing this, taking that time to pray. And if they hadn't taken time to pray, they probably would have made a rash decision, and that probably would have been the wrong decision. Well, notice in verse 24 that uh, it says, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all. Well, that's important because we have to remember the disciples didn't know the heart of Judas Iscariot. As a matter of fact, they trusted him so much they let him carry the money bag. Judas really had the disciples fooled. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, he knew his heart, and he also knew the hearts of uh, both Matthias and Barsabbas, who are here as the two of the disciples are trying to decide um, uh, to be the twelfth disciple. So Jesus knows their hearts as well. Now, I'm sure both men were godly men who loved the Lord, but Ultimately, Jesus could see their hearts, and he knew which one was more qualified to, to be the next disciple, and, and who he wanted to be the next disciple. So the disciples were asking Jesus to help them make the right decision, because they didn't want to accidentally pick another Judas. Well, after they prayed, they cast lots to see who God was choosing, which was kind of like flipping a coin. Now, at first glance, that sounds like the wrong way to make their decision, and, and that's how I always read it when I was a kid, was uh, they shouldn't have done this. Uh, but they actually were obeying Scripture by doing this. In the book of Numbers, God instructed the Israelites to cast lots to determine the division of the promised land for each tribe of Israel. Uh, and then in First Chronicles, we see that lots were cast to determine different offices and functions for the people who worked in the temple. So obviously, uh, that was a godly thing to do. That's what God wanted them to do. And then in Proverbs 16, verse 33, we're told, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So, during Old Testament times, when God's people were not indwelt by the Holy Spirit, that's one of the ways they made decisions. Now, at this point in Acts, the disciples, they don't yet have the Holy Spirit. So they're following God's instructions from the Old Testament in order to make the right decision. And, of course, they've bathed it in prayer before they cast the lots. So what they say, Lord, you know the hearts of these men. You know all men's hearts. Um, you, God, make the decision. They prayed about it. 
So when the lot fell on Matthias, they knew that God had chosen him to be the twelfth disciple. Well, what about us today as Christians? It's important for us to never make big decisions without first praying about it. You know, there's so many people who don't pray, and then they make their decisions based on emotions or circumstances or feelings or carnal desires. Hey, I've done that plenty of times, and it never ends well. James chapter 1 verse 5 tells us, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Uh, Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about every excuse me, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Right now, uh, many of us have big decisions to make because the coronavirus is affecting every part of our lives. I recently was talking with some pastors, and the question they were asking was, should we reopen our churches even though the governor says not yet? Some churches are asking if they'll even be able to reopen once they're allowed to because the bills are piling up and no money is coming in. Um, a lot of businesses in our nation are asking those same questions, especially here in Maine. We're seeing it right now. Now, brothers and sisters, when you're dealing with big decisions and you don't know what to do, take it to the Lord in prayer. He'll give the guidance that you need. We see him doing it here with the disciples and he will do it with you and me. And all of us probably have examples of that in our past of times that he's done that for us. Um, so in closing, when you're asking, what decision should I make? I'd encourage you to always start by asking the Lord. He knows the outcome when we don't. And he will always give us the wisdom and the peace that we need to make the right decision. Well, if you've listened to the sermon today and you're not a Christian, I'll tell you right now that you have a big decision to make. You see, Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world, yours and mine. And if you believe that with all your heart, then make that decision today to put your trust in him. Nothing you've ever done is too bad to be out of the mercy and grace and forgiveness of Christ and his love. Um, make that decision today to put your trust in him. He loves you. He gave his life for you, and he'll welcome you into heaven when you take your last breath. But you have to make that right decision. Jesus or nothing. I encourage you, make that decision for Jesus.